Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Bennett, the Research Manager at the Royal Armouries, and welcome to our Winter Lecture Series. Welcome to people from Oklahoma and the land. Uh, if you've been brought to us by the vagaries of the algorithm and you're not quite sure where you are, we are the UK's national collection of arms and armour. We began as the, as the medieval stockpile at the Tower of London, where we still retain a base. However, in the mid-1990s, we expanded, transferring much of our artillery collection to a Victorian fortification outside Portsmouth and opening our main purpose-designed museum in Leeds, where we tell the story of arms and armour from prehistory to the present day. All three of these sites are now open, although pre-booking is strongly advisable. However, uh, if you're not traveling at the moment, or alternatively, if you're overseas, like some of our guests, uh, we do have an extensive program of online content, including blogs, features, and the online catalog, as well as talks and online events. Whatever you're interested in, you'll find more details on our website, which is royalarmories.org. This winter lecture series runs until the end of March 2022 and we'll cover an eclectic mix of topics relating to arms and armour over the centuries. We'll be looking at everything from Anglo-Saxon swords to missiles steered by artificial intelligence, from the First World War naval bombardment of the north, uh, northeast coast of England to a Japanese retelling of the King Arthur legend. As usual, all the talks will be broadcast live on Zoom and YouTube, and will stay available to watch on YouTube if you're unable to join us on the day. So keep an eye on our website or follow us on Eventbrite to stay up to date with these events. For now, if you're joining us live, you'll have opportunities to ask questions to the speaker after the talk. Uh, although obviously put them in during the talk and I will ask them after the event, if that makes sense. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you do this by typing your question in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and if you're watching via Zoom, you'll find a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can type questions. Uh, as always, while we can't guarantee to get through all of them, we will try and cover as many as we can. So with the necessary preparation out of the way, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Toby Capwell. Those of you who joined us for our Field of Cloth of Gold conference in, back in 2020 uh, will hopefully remember his paper on jousting there. Others may know him better as the curator of Arms and Armour at the Wallace Collection or from his extensive research into early English armour. Today's lecture ties into his upcoming book, Armour of the English Knights, 1450 to 1500, an incredibly challenging study due to the limited material evidence for the style in question. So without any further ado then, Toby Capwell. Aha, here I am. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'll just get this thing running here and uh, we'll be on our way. Right. Yeah. So as Mark kindly said, uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about my work on armor in late medieval England, a subject which is challenging, um, mainly for the simple reason that no English armor uh, made in late medieval England survives, um, or any that we can positively identify anyway. Um, and this is a subject that began for me when I was uh, a curatorial assistant at the Royal Armouries in the late 90s. Um, and I've sort of been working on it ever since. It was the subject of my PhD, uh, which was completed in 2004. And I kept working on it after that. With another 15 years or, or so of work, I have two publications of a set of three. Uh, the second book has just been published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the project is is carries the overall title of Armor of the English Knight. And uh, I thought, of, you know, we could talk some about uh, where that research has taken me, where it has reached uh, this up to this point in in publication and where it's a bit of where it's going next. Uh, first, though, I, I should just say a little bit about myself, because my, my own experience and the nature of my own interest in this subject has a lot to do with uh, how I've investigated armor in England um, in the absence of any actual armor. Uh, I'm from the United States originally, and uh, my older family comes from New York City, and I spent a lot of time there as a child. And when I was about four years old, I was taken to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for the first time. And, uh, you know, the Met 
as many of you will already know, has one of the world's great collections of medieval Renaissance arms and armor uh, displayed in these gorgeous daylit galleries. Now, this uh, image isn't what it looks like now. This is more like what it was circa 1977 when I first went there. And, uh, you know, this was an awesome, life changing experience. And, you know, I, I was not just impressed by these equestrian figures. I wanted to be one of them. I sensed that they kind of radiated this incredible power and splendor and majesty. And um, I wanted that, <laughs> basically, a power mad four year old. Uh, so that's really where I come from. You know, I come from a place where I, from a very young age, I realized that these objects had incredible expressive power uh, beyond their functional attributes. And I've always striven to look at armor as expressive art and functional technology for fighting all at the same time. Uh, skipping ahead from being four years old uh, a, a couple of decades uh, i first joined the royal armories when they they opened in 1996 first as a, a horseman primarily uh working on their jousting program uh, and then as a curatorial assistant volunteering while i uh, entered my graduate studies that would hopefully qualify me for curatorial work um, i then went on to be Curator of Arms and Armor at Glasgow Museums in the early 2000s, uh, overseeing the redisplay of the Arms and Armor collection in the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery Museum. And uh, since 2006, I've been uh, Curator of Arms and Armor at the Wallace Collection in London. And again, this is a collection that many uh, of you will already know, although it's one of the smallest national museums. It contains, again, one of the finest collections of medieval and Renaissance arms and armor in the world. And Sir Richard Wallace, as a 19th century collector, was interested in it almost purely for its artistic qualities. He wasn't a big game hunter or an ex-soldier or a military historian or any of the other life pursuits that inform 19th century collecting. So the Wallace has been a great place for me to really explore the uh, art historical, the expressive, the decorative aspects of armor, as well as, of course, its, its technical side. And, you know, I, I, I guess I have to admit that, you know, following on from being a four-year-old child, I wanted to be a knight a long time before I wanted to be a curator in a museum, however. And um, I've been a practitioner of what you might call the knightly martial arts, both on horses and on foot, uh, since it's, I was a teenager, really. And uh, I've been involved in tournaments and jousting and the development of the modern um, historical martial arts community. Uh, ever since. And, uh, you know, it's been a big, it was a, a big part of my life every year since then, uh, right up until last year when nothing really happened. Uh, but things are starting to happen again, and I'm, I'm still active, uh, how I, however I can be. And I'm, I'm just covering this because I think it's important that, that you understand that I'm, I'm trying to look at this subject from the point of view of the people who were there. I'm trying to understand armor from the inside. What is the, what is the experience of the wearer? What is this equipment really there to, to do? And how does it vary? How does it change? If the, you know, there are different styles of, of armor, even in a single period. So what is that all about in human terms? How do these different armors perform and, and what can they tell us about the wider historical and human contexts uh, of the time that we're interested in? So uh, there are a couple of fundamentals that, uh, that govern the way we need to think about late medieval armor. Uh, first and foremost, if 
anybody's heard me talk any any time recently in the last few years, you may already have heard this. But first and foremost, if if you remember nothing else about armor from my talk today, remember this: that all armor, whether you're a Greek hoplite, a medieval knight, or you know the driver of a Challenger tank. All armor is governed by what I might call the universal law of armor design. Uh, the inverse principle of armor design. That is that armor has two key physical attributes. The protection that it provides for the wearer on the one hand, and the mobility that it allows on the other hand protection and mobility. This is what makes the armor world go round. The problem is, or the challenge, the inherent design challenge is that protection and mobility are inversely proportional. So as you increase one, you lose on the other. If you want more mobility, you have to sacrifice protection. If you want more protection, you have to lose on mobility. More protection means bigger plates, thicker, heavier plates. That's going to be more tiring to carry. It's going to be more inflexible. Mobility goes down. If you want more mobility, the plates have to be thinner and lighter. There needs to be more articulation, less coverage of the body. Mobility goes up, protection goes down. And in the late middle, by the late Middle Ages, this principle was very well understood. And different armor designers, whoever they were, the armors working with their patrons, it's a collaborative process, undoubtedly. Um, over time, different styles develop that emphasize different balances or different imbalances of those two principles. Because sometimes an imbalance is actually what you want. You have to have that protection and you're willing to sacrifice mobility. Similarly, in other times, you have got to have the mobility and the loss of protection is worth paying for. And if you, if you drop yourself into any historical period, you can interrogate the armor of that moment according to this universal law. You should immediately think, okay, how much protection does this give? how much mobility, what kind of sacrifices are they making, that will tell you a lot about what they are trying to achieve and what they're doing in the armor. So if we take the typical you know, man-at-arms of the early 15th century, as we have here, the Agincourt period, um, you can see that the way the, the various weights play out, there's a, there's a big possible, quite a large, uh, degree of variation at the bottom in the total weight limit. A guy who looks like this can weigh, can be carrying 20 kilos of armor or 35. And his outward appearance won't actually change very much, interestingly. But, you know, the, the thickness of the helmet, the thickness of the breastplate, whether he's wearing a full male shirt or just male parts under the armor, does he have enclosed legs? Does he have enclosed arms? All of that adds up really fast. So, you know, the armor can be functionally different without actually looking physically that different. Uh, and the same knight might wear his armor in a couple of different ways to be in the lighter configuration or a heavier configuration, depending on, again, what he thinks he's going to be doing and what he is up against. At Agincourt, for example, a number of the French eyewitnesses say that the French knights specifically elected to wear full male shirts under their plate armor. They were, they were accentuating that protection and they were willing to take uh, a cut in mobility, carrying more weight uh, in that environment, but they were facing 5,000 heavily armed archers and 1,500 1, English men at arms. You know, they, they could see the protection uh, was going to be important. Now, of course, an, a, a knight of the late Middle Ages has to be someone who is prepared to fight both on horseback and on foot. 
they they need to be trained to do everything. And you know, moment to moment, they might be ordered to mount or, or dismount, deploy on foot, route an enemy on, on horseback. Knights have to be trained to fight in full plate armor in all situations. And not just one-on-one, -on -one, in battles, different battles have can have very different dynamics, depending on the topography, depending on the, rel the numbers of the sides, uh, how is your enemy armed versus how are your troops armed? There, there's a lot of different potential considerations. And the armor that you take into that environment is a part of that. Uh, all plate armor shares you know, certain factors, but it's analogous really in, in many respects to automobiles. You, know, you wanna have the right automobile for the job that you're doing. You can take the children to school in an articulated lorry. You can get the job done, but that's not really the best equipment for the job. Similarly with armor, if, uh, if a knight is configured for heavy cavalry combat, but something unexpected happens and he has to deploy on foot, they get off their horses and they do their best. But if they know that they are habitually going to fight in a particular way, they will, they will optimize their armor uh, accordingly. And uh, you know, over the last 30 years of my involvement in, in the, the practical community and in the, in the world of knightly martial arts practitioners, I've had uh, you know, long-term chances to explore a lot of this. And, and my own thinking about it is, is very much led by that experience of knowing what different kinds of armors feel like from the inside and thinking, boy, this is fine on a horse, but I don't think I'd want to have to get off like this. Or, um, you know, here I am facing heavy cavalry. I don't, I'm not sure I feel like I have enough protection or I can't move enough or I can see too much. You know, all of that years of sort of practical experience has has come into this as well. Uh, and and fighting on foot as well. There's a lot, there's a very uh, uh, rich and vibrant martial arts community out there now. If any, some of you are already involved in this. Um, if, uh, if you aren't, but you want to, there are lots of places to do it. Armored fighting seminars and clubs and classes and all sorts of things. Um, I've been involved in a bit of a bit of everything, and uh, you know I'm I've always got both hats on. I've always got my practitioner hat on and my academic hat, and the the those two roles really have a lot to offer each other, and they certainly have uh, benefited me enormously. Really led my whole methodology in my own research over the last twenty years. So having gotten interested in uh, in armor in England uh, as a, a, a research assistant at the Royal Armouries. Um, I, I had to look back in time. I'm interested in the 15th century, but it's always important to look backwards and forwards in time and to understand what happens with armor in England. We have to know something of the history of uh, knights in England and the, the experiences that they went through as a culture over time and, and the decisions that they made about how they were going to fight. As I, um, as I outlined in the introduction to the first Armor of the English Knight book, the, the English actually had a tradition of dismounting their men-at-arms and, and knights in armor in the 12th century. There's quite a lot of evidence for the English uh, nobility fighting on foot uh, if it suited them in the 12th century. But in the 13th century, that, that seems to have fallen away. And in, uh, in England, they really started to fight very much as continental Europeans. This is the great, the first great age of medieval heavy cavalry. Uh, this is when the joust is coming to the fore as a major form of knightly formal combat. Uh, the battles of the 13th century are characterized by lots of famous cavalry charges, successful and unsuccessful both. And, uh, and the, English, the English fought in this way uh, as much as anyone else. Up to 1315, 
1315, the English suffered a horrendous defeat at Bannockburn, fighting the Scots under Robert the Bruce. Uh, it was a real catastrophe for the, the English uh, knightly nobility. Uh, many of their leading nobles were killed. They all deployed on horseback, very ineffectual. The Scots led this battle in every way. They determined the ground. They chose the ground. They fought on their own terms. Robert the Bruce is a very skilled military commander. And the English were uh, beaten decisively. And it, it was a real kind of cultural trauma. And it, in my opinion, it really, it really motivated a fundamental rethink among the English nobility, uh, you know, going back to the drawing board and thinking what happened. And if we're going to keep fighting the Scots or the French, what are we going to do differently? And they actually learned a lot from the Scots. They paid attention. And you see the English in the 1320s and 30s fighting like the Scots with dismounted knights, uh, reinforcing their common infantry with archers first as, as a secondary uh, uh, wing, but very quickly becoming an integral part of it. The Scots primarily fought with their knights on foot with uh, uh, mixed infantry, lightly armed common infantry with their famous shiltrons of uh, long spears. They also had light cavalry and archers, which played important roles in Bannockburn too, uh, but, but in, in fewer numbers. The English took that, they got the dismount the knights part, but then under Edward III, the English developed this way of fighting to involve uh, many more archers, massed ranks of longbowmen, working very closely with uh, significant numbers of uh, dismounted knights. And the, the proportions tell you something about the thinking. Initially, it was half and half, half armored knights on foot, half archers. Then it goes up to two thirds archers. Then it goes up to three quarters archers. And by the, by the time of Agincourt, you have basically 80% of the army is archers and 20% uh, or so uh, is men at arms. Uh, and this worked very well up throughout the Hundred Years War, up until the middle of the 15th century. Um, and, and so, but, but there up to the middle of the 15th century, there have been a hundred years where the English had been developing these tactics and working the bugs out and refining the tactics and the equipment goes with the tactics. If you have a, a specific way of fighting, you need to design equipment that's appropriate, that's optimized for that way of fighting. If you expect that you're going to be fighting most of the time on foot, then your armor design has to take account of that. You can't be carrying too much weight because you're going to be on foot. You're going to be carrying that weight yourself. Uh, but there are also a number of other key uh, design attributes that you will be looking for. Now, uh, back to my own studies of, of the, the actual evidence. As we said, there's no English armor surviving from before the 16th century, really. So. What have we got to work on? And you know, where does this idea that there is a, a distinctive style of armor design in England come from anyway? Um, after you've looked at the military context and, and, the, and the specificity of English tactics, it seems like there should be some pretty specific armor design going on. But where do we look for it? Well, when I was a uh, an assistant at the Royal Armories, I discovered the Armories photo archive, uh, which is extraordinary. You know, file cabinets full of these wonderful um, uh, uh, eight by 10 photographs of everything, armor, paintings, sculpture, and funerary monuments. Uh, funerary monuments are our most important source in this, uh, in this study. There, there are a huge number, comparatively speaking, a huge number of effigies, life-sized high-relief sculptures of dead knights in English churches. 
This is an art form that became popular in the late 12th century and increasingly popular all the way through, uh, well, into the modern period. And uh, this is the documentation that we are looking for, the three-dimensional life-size documentation of real armor rendered with extraordinary uh, realism and technical detail. And when I realized, you know, just beavering around in, in, the, uh, in the Royal Armory's library on my breaks in the late 90s, when I realized that there were over 230 effigies uh, of knights and men at arms dating just from the 15th century, I knew that I had my PhD and probably quite a lot more besides. Of those 230, about 10 were pretty well known. There's a group of about 10 that are in all the books, in all the books about arms and armor or in all the books about the Wars of the Roses or, or, or whatever. If you're interested in this period, there's about 10 that you should know from the general literature. Uh, foremost, the, the, uh, the copper gilt effigy of Sir Richard Beecham uh, in Warwick. Uh, this is this effigy here is also in Warwick. Uh, this is Thomas Beecham, uh, one of his 14th, late 14th century forebears. Uh, so, but of, there's there's those ten that everybody knows. But then there are over 200 others that have never really been looked at, never really been, certainly haven't been interrogated by an arms and armor person specifically from that perspective, and and certainly not uh, studied comprehensively as a complete group. So that was really my PhD, spending two and a half years driving around England and Wales, finding these things, looking at them, photographing them, and then spending another two years trying to figure out what it all means. I didn't figure out what it all means, but I figured out enough of it to write up a PhD. But in 2004, my PhD wasn't really in a publishable form still. There were fundamental questions that didn't need to be in a PhD, but would need to be in any published work. So it was quite a long process to convert the PhD into something publishable that I could feel like I could stand by um, in perpetuity. Uh, and it's taken a long time, but I, the, the first book, which covers the period 1400 to 1450, was published in 2015. 1450 to 1500 just came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the third book is coming out next year. I'll say more about that in a minute. But just to move to some of the conclusions, you know, we don't have a lot of time today. So I, I want to just go through some of the basic conclusions and the results of the research. Uh, if you're interested, you know, there's lots of ways to pursue it further. Um, basically, I was, I was really amazed to find that how much detail the effigies give us, uh, not just about the, the, the prevailing style of a particular decade or, or, or whatever, but how much detail in variation the effigies give us. Uh, they show us within a particular style or substyle how much individual armors could vary, um, and what were the uh, what were the parameters of the style? Uh, how much did it vary before you really need to consider it a development, the next style or the next sub the next iteration of the style in a more advanced state? And really, decade by decade, these, arm, these effigies allow me to build up quite a detailed uh, story of the technical and aesthetic evolution of a style of armor that was distinctive and unique to England. And uh, unsurprisingly, in hindsight, I suppose, it's obvious when you know, uh, these armors are clearly optimized in their design for fighting on foot, uh, at least up to the middle of the 15th century. 
uh, and you start to see that, and you can really, decade by decade, you can see the thought process. You can see the areas where um, something wasn't quite good enough. They weren't getting quite enough out of a style. Uh, and they wanted more articulation, but without having to sacrifice too much protection and different ideas are tried, some endure, some fall away fairly quickly. Um, and another really interesting thing about this, once you, once you kind of take stock of where you've arrived from 1400 to 1450, is that, you know, the dating is not directly sequential. All of these uh, substyles of the English, um, uh, of English armor technology, they all overlap, just like real technology. You know, it, it, you know, some people are still driving cars that are 15 years old now, while other people have the very latest thing every year or every other year. Um, if, the, if this was simply a story of the effigy carvers periodically upgrading or changing their patterns, then, you know, you wouldn't have this, this, this fluid overlap of different styles. You wouldn't see effigies where they have an older cuirass with a newer helmet um, or, you know, old arms and legs with a new helmet and cuirass or whatever. This is all stuff that we see in the effigies. The effigies show us a living art form, a living technology. And you know the only way they can have done that is if it was a, a, a central principle of the art form that they represent real arms and armor with as much faithfulness as they are able to. It's really a, um, a, a fundamental of the art form uh, that the arms and armor be lifelike and believable. Of course, it doesn't stop in 14. Uh, oh, oh, yes, just before we move on. Uh, now, by the, by the 1430s, you can really see the English perfecting a style of armor that is optimized for foot combat, really as far as it can go. Uh, and, and on an armor like this of the late 1430s, early 1440s, there are a number of different foot combat uh, choices that we see here. First, the great bassinet. This is a, a very heavily fortified uh, form of helmet that's a development of the old bassinet with male aventail, but the aventail is, is augmented and then replaced with, with solid neck plates, visor, the high skull. This gives as good a protection for the head and neck as you could ever expect. And if you imagine yourself in the front line of a battle, you know, the knights are going, they're going to be defending themselves, but they're going to be getting hit all the time from the sides and from other people that they're not immediately opposing. And they need that heavy fortification on their head, one of the most uh, exposed areas. They're also, though, fighting with um, a lot of two handed weapons on foot, spears. Uh, two-handed pole axes, two-handed swords, that those are the weapons of the knight on foot. And, you know, your grip can be changing around uh, with those weapons all the time. So you need symmetrical arm and shoulder defenses. Uh, the asymmetry, asymmetry that you see on other styles uh, is really related to fighting on horseback, which is an inherently asymmetric activity. Uh, but on foot, you need good mobility in your arms and shoulders, as well as that symmetrical movement. So, the, and that's again what we see here. Uh, you also need a cuirass with a long skirt of articulated plates that come down and give good protection to the to the abdomen, the lower torso, the hips, the groin, while also maintaining uh, as much mobility as possible. So. Uh, uh, also, it, enclosed leg protection is uh, an important feature of foot combat armor. Uh, the lower leg on most 15th century armor is enclosed anyway, but the English habitually enclose the upper leg as well. And they often have mail covering the backs of the knees too. 
And finally, for fighting on foot, you need good plate protection for the feet, but you mustn't uh, hamper the mobility of the ankle too much. Uh, continental sabatons, the foot plates, often have uh, plate tongues that go up the front and back of the greave. Uh, and this ensures a good overlap, but it, it starts to limit the movement of the ankle. The English don't want that, so they usually have a, a low cut sabaton that stays free in its action from the greave. And all of that adds up to an armor that's optimized for fighting on foot. And if you don't believe that, take account of this, the similarity, the close functional technical similarity between an English armor of the 1430s and beyond and foot combat armors like this of the very late 15th and early 16th centuries. These are tournament armors. They're not for war. They're specifically for fighting uh, formal combats in the Champ Close with the axe and the two-handed sword and so forth. Now, although the aesthetics of this Italian-made thing are a bit different, look at the technical attributes. It's all exactly the same as an English armor of almost 100 years earlier. The great bassinet, symmetrical arm and shoulder defenses, the sk long skirt, fully enclosed upper and lower legs, and the free acting sabatons. It's all there on a specialized foot combat armor of the 16th century. And now in England, things were changing in the 1450s, however. The uh, Hundred Years' War was over and England kind of imploded in the, the Wars of the Roses, the series of dynastic conflicts that continued sporadically uh, from the 1450s into the, the late 1480s. Now, initially in the Wars of the Roses, the English tried to fight each other in the way that they had fought the French in the previous few generations. Dismounted knights, lots of archers. Uh, but fighting each other that way didn't really appear to work so well. First of all, the, everyone's familiar with the tactics and everyone is starting to try and find ways of defeating them. Uh, you can't defeat your own tactics with your own tactics. You need to try new things or you need to emphasize other aspects of deployment that you might not have preferred before. And uh, you know, there are a number of facets to this. The introduction, the greater use of mixed infantry, medium infantry, halberdiers, billmen, uh, uh, troops like that. Uh, and also uh, an increasing uh, reintroduction of heavy cavalry, of, knight, of the knights themselves fighting again on horseback. So in, in, in my most recent published part of this, now we're looking at the second half of the 15th century, there's a, the, the design demands, the functional demands, the challenges to the design are getting more complicated because they still want to fight on foot, but they have to be, they need armors now that are a bit more balanced, that are a bit more sympathetic to jumping up into the saddle when you need to. And the, the, the interesting thing for me is that the English style in the, in the, in the second half of the 15th century, uh, that the, the rate of change becomes much more uh, rapid and the changes can sometimes be more radical. And sometimes things are tried, but then disappear very quickly. Look at the dating here. You know, we're now not talking about, you know, spans of 15 or 20 years. We're talking about 10 years or even five years where things come in and then drop out again. And there's also on top of the technical concerns, there's an evolving kind of cultural aesthetic. What this generation of, of English knights is attracted to visually. Um, and, and again, it keeps developing right up until the, when in the end of the 15th century, the, the English style has evolved very far away from its beginnings in the early 15th century. And what we end up with 
is something that now again is is moving more towards uh, an exclusive, almost exclusive heavy cavalry armor. Never entirely, um, but you know now we have asymm asymmetrical shoulder defenses, a big shield-like plate on the left shoulder. This is classic cavalry equipment. A solid one-piece breastplate that can resist. Uh, you know, probably has some chance against gunfire as well as crossbow shooting and longbow shooting. We have the bigger tassets, the shorter skirt. We've lost the enclosed uh, leg armor and the sabatons have been integrated into the greave. Uh, we haven't lost all trace of the, the classic English style of the late Middle Ages, but it's well on its way out by the end of the century. Uh, and it's always quite fun to look at where you've been and where you've come. Uh, this, is, this is the whole story of just the English style from 1400 to 1500. And I just, I love how when you look at things like this, how not only can you identify that this is what it looked like in 1400 and this is what it looked like in 1500, that's the, that's the standard in most books, but you can see how they got there. You can see the whole process of evolution by artificial selection. And of course, this is not purely a closed system. This is not just the story of what domestic English armorers were doing for their wealthy clients. Uh, we have that style, let's, let's arrange it all in one line. Where my book, where my project is going next, where the, the, the book project is going next in book three, is the whole question of the presence of foreign armor in England. Uh, that's the, that's the, the content of the third book. I'm just going to give you a little sneak peek of it today for fun. There are a number of different continental styles that come into play from about 1435. The, the 1430s is when we start seeing a lot of documentary evidence for the importation of huge numbers of predominantly Italian, but also Flemish armor into England. Um, and we also, crucially, from around 1435, we can see it, uh, we can recognize it as distinct in English art. In brasses, for example, the lower status knights tended to acquire cheaper imported Italian armor, and it's, and it's recorded for posterity on the, their cheaper two-dimensional funerary monuments. Now, there are a few um, high-relief uh, effigies that show Italian armor as well. Not very many, but a few. These are all discussed to exhaustion in book three, I assure you. Uh, but the important thing for us here for the moment is that uh, Although there's no English armor surviving, there's no way of verifying the accuracy of the English effigies from that point of view directly. When we have an English effigy showing an Italian armor, we have direct comparisons. We can verify the incredible fidelity of English effigies when they are showing us Italian armor because, you know, comparatively speaking, plenty of Italian armor survives. And we can compare the effigy, our reconstruction of the original armor with surviving Italian armors in modern museum collections. Uh, and there are also, a number, beyond the basic you know, ex Italian export armor, there are other fascinating styles that are more um, limited in their chronology. The, uh, the Flemish armor became increasingly important in England and increasingly influential towards the end of the 15th century. Uh, but that's another story for another time. I'll just, uh, I'll wrap up because we, we really do need to leave some time for a uh, question and answer. Um, so if, you, if, you, if you're more interested in this, I can refer you to my books, uh, two of three published. Uh, I'm working hard on the final one. It'll be out next year one way or another. Um, if you want to also find out more about what I'm up to from day to day and different research projects and different things going on 
uh, at the museum. You, you can uh, follow me on Instagram and, and do all the usual things that, uh, that we do these days. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So thank you, Toby. Uh, we have got questions flooding in, so I'll probably warn people at this stage. I think we're going to probably run over our uh, three o'clock target, if that's okay with Toby and Adam yeah, in the background. Yeah. Mark, but, Mark I just, sorry, I, I do have to. I do have to run off at three. Okay, um, perfect. But uh, maybe we can maybe we can take stock of questions that I don't get to. If you want to email me those afterwards, I don't know if there's a way of disseminating that really, but. Um, uh, we can figure something out, I'm sure. We'll figure something out. Uh, so the thing that particularly interests me, and I'm going to nip in first if that's okay, how in practical terms would an English style develop if there's no military magazines, the state can't control exactly what's being manufactured? How does this English style come about? Well, they did. I mean, they, they did have... England is a small community, but, uh, but quite wealthy, certainly in the late 14th century. And there was a, a vibrant community of highly skilled, very well-paid armors in London. And uh, London must have been the heart of the English armor making community, but not, but not to the exclusion of other places. We know there were highly skilled armors in York. Uh, Edward III's royal armors who made the, his personal equipment were, uh, were based in York, not London. And we have you know, mentions of armors based in many other places around the country. Um, I mean, we can't always be sure when you, when you read armors, you can't be sure if they're armor merchants or armor makers or armor um, mechanics. You know, the guy, who, the guy who fixes your car didn't make your car. And I think there are plenty of members of the wider armor, make, armor community who were simply maintenance guys. <laughs> refurbishers, et cetera. But even so, we know that there were some really high, highly skilled makers in London. Uh, the London Armors uh, Company evolved in the late 14th century and was granted a royal charter by Henry VI in 1456. The tower was the, the base of the royal wardrobes armor operation. Uh, so they did have a nucleus that could that could you know kind of drive their own their own technology, and then there's the individual nobleman, the powerful nobleman who have however much money they need to 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 have the very latest uh, equipment made for their personal uh, uh, uses. A question that ties into that from Catherine Hamley: Is there any contemporary literary evidence about? This particular style of armor, because I know you've used "à la façon d'Angleterre," which I wasn't sure if that was a specific yeah, quote from a. It is. It is. Sorry, I meant to mention that, but I was rushing through. Uh, "À la façon d'Angleterre" is a really important mention because it appears in a Burgundian inventory. Uh, it's actually like a. It's some. It's a. It's a purchase receipt uh, of a bunch of armor that uh, Duke uh, Philip the Good bought in the 1430s, uh, 1438, if memory serves, you can look it up in the book. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, it's in the book. Um, but that's really important because it says that, that the Burgundian Duke bought a pair of gauntlets in the English fashion. So it's not the English saying, hey, here's our style. It's a foreigner telling us that they recognize that there is armor that is distinctively English. And you know, there are a few other examples like that coming from Germany and things in German references to English bassinets, for example. And that all, that all ties up really well with how the, the English style was really distinguishing itself in the, like the second quarter of the, of the 15th century. A joint question from uh, Neil and Stephen, and in fact, a uh, similar thing. Why are there no surviving 15th century English armors? What might have happened to them? Yeah, why, 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 why? Everybody always asks me why. And why is the most difficult question of all, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I spent the first six months of my PhD wrestling with the question why, and I got hardly anything done. And I had a very serious talking to with my, with my panel six months in and they said, Toby, you've just wasted six, six months 
on questions you shouldn't be dealing with. You should be worried about what, when, where, maybe a bit of how, but don't even go near why. Uh, and that was some very good advice, actually. And I actually was able to complete the PhD, but it was mostly because I was avoiding why until the very end. Um, but I mean, it is an important question. Uh, and there's several levels to it. First, um, the, the probability of any armor surviving from the 15th century is remote. The odds are terrible. Just, just take this, for example. You know, Milan was one of the most, the largest, um, most productive armor making centers in the late Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. You know, there, I, I talk a lot more about this in book three of English Night. But there were, there were huge workshops with hundreds of craftsmen employed in them in Milan. And there were, there were workshops that could produce a complete armor at a rate of one per day. And then they, they contract together uh, to produce three complete armors per day. And they're outfitting whole armies with thousands of armors. There's probably hundreds of thousands of full plate armors made in Milan in the second half of the 15th century and 13 survive, something like that. And of those 13, something like 10 come from only two highly improbable preservation contexts, Kerberg Castle and the sanctuary at Cortatone near Mantova. Flukish rolls of the cosmic dice. If you didn't have Kerberg and Mantova, you would have hardly any Italian armor surviving at all either. I mean, there's lots of helmets and bits and pieces knocking about, but just go with me on this. So what are the chances when you're a much smaller operation than that? I mean, London, you know, London had between 40 and 70 masters active at different points, depending on how, how bad the plague had been in a particular decade or whatever. Um, but they were a smaller community. How many, arm, how many English armors were actually made in the first place? Um, who knows, 5,000, I don't know, but not very many, comparatively speaking. So, you know, there's almost no chance that any of it will survive, I think. And, and, also, and also England is a place where raw materials are more valuable and, and, and recycling is gonna be much more common. The English didn't have their own steel. In the late Middle Ages, they had to import all of their steel, thousands of tons of steel every year from Spain. Um, so armor is much more likely to get chopped up and made into other things over time as well, probably. And there's a lot of other levels to it, undoubtedly. But so far, we still haven't found any. I think that answers Neil's question as well. Although hypothetically, you could reevaluate pieces in collections and find, you know, find some English 15th century stuff. In practice, it has probably uh, gone by the wayside. I, I think the chances of, of you know, proving that this this breastplate in this collection is English, it's vanishingly remote. I, I just don't. I wouldn't expect it to happen. But I didn't believe that that skeleton was Richard III either. So I, I hope I'm wrong. Mark has asked if, we, if it's possible to get access to the photo files you mentioned from the Royal Armouries. Uh, as far as I know, all our collection is open to the public. So email inquiries at royalarmouries.org uh, and have a word with them uh, about it. But in theory, yeah, as long as you can make it over, there's nothing stopping you uh, having a look. So... I guess just very quickly, a, a, a common question has been uh, late medieval knights equipping different pieces of equipment. Would they have had specific sets? Would it have been a case of just taking individual pieces off, off one set of armor to fit it for horse rather than field? Yeah. Um, well, different, different styles in the 15th century have different degrees of variability. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for example, the Italians, the Italian armor is predominantly uh, expected to be used by heavy cavalry, but they wear their mail in a certain way that allows the pauldrons to be taken off if they need to. Uh, for example, they often wear full male shirts 
under their cuirasses. So if they need to, they can actually take the whole cuirass off and just fight in an instantly lighter, more mobile way. Uh, you see different degrees of variability built into these armors. Um, in England, there's not a lot of variability. The armors are what they are. And it's about just balancing the design accordingly. The, um, I mean, one, one main thing you can always change is the, the helmet type. You know, there's the, there's the Salat and Bever, the classic helmet of the 15th century. That's a good all-round helmet. But if you know you're going to be fighting on horseback and heavy cavalry charge or whatever, you can swap the, 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 the Salat and Bever out for an armet if you want to, for example. There's a certain amount of, of um, changeability like that. I mean, the 15th century was really only the beginning of the realization that you could use plate armor like that. And um, you know, you see that thought, those thoughts processes occurring in the second half of the 15th century in Europe as well as in England. And that really you know, gives rise in the 16th century to the garniture system where you do have interchangeable parts on the same, that can be swapped in and out to configure the armor for light, medium, heavy cavalry, heavy infantry, light infantry, whatever. That's really a later part of the story in the 16th century. So conscious of the needs to keep to time, but if people have questions that aren't answered, with the book as the first resource, are there any social media accounts that you'd like to, to direct them towards? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my Instagram is the first one. That's the easiest way to find out what, what's going on with me moment to moment. Um, I, I put I put news and things out on on Facebook too from time to time, um, you know the usual the usual places. I was going to say if if there are other questions uh, more generically about medieval warfare, again inquiries at armories.org.uk will get you through to one of our curators who uh, you know can can hopefully step into Toby's stead and, and answer stuff. But uh, again, we're coming up to the end of the period, so. Thank you very much, Toby, for today's lecture. Uh, thank you to Adam for producing the event behind the scenes from his sick bed, <laughs> and to the audience for taking time out of your day to attend and for all the questions you've had. Very sorry that we weren't able to get through them all, but if you'd like to ask them to either Toby or to the museum, we will do our best to field them. So yes, yes. our next talk is on the 17th of November in two weeks' time. It's a commemoration of the 150th anniversary of Fort Nelson's opening. Uh, our curator of artillery, Phil McGrath, We'll be looking at the fort's hidden histories, uncovering the stories of the people who built it and the soldiers who manned it. Uh, for details of these and all our other events, keep an eye on our website, which is royalarmies.org. Uh, follow us on social media network of your choice and consider following us on Eventbrite. In the meantime, thank you again for spending time with us today and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. Okay, see you later, everybody. Thanks, Mark. No problem, thank you.